History and Nature Titanic This article is about the passenger liner. For the film by James Cameron, see Titanic, 1997 film. For other uses, see Titanic, Disambiguation. Titanic departing Southampton on April 10, 1912. History, United Kingdom. Name RMS Titanic. Owner White Star Line. Operator White Star Line. Port of Registry United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland Liverpool, England. Route Southampton to New York City. Ordered September 17, 1908. Builder Harland and Wolf, Belfast. Cost £1.5 million, £150 million in 2019. Yard number 401. Way number 400. Laid down March 31, 1909. Launched May 31, 1911. Completed April 2, 1912. Maiden voyage April 10, 1912. In service 1912. Out of service April 15, 1912. Identification. UK official number 131428. Code letters HVMP. Wireless call sign MGY. Fate struck an iceberg at 11.40 p.m., ship's time, April 14, 1912 on her maiden voyage and sank two hours 40 minutes later on April 15, 1912, 111 years ago. Status wreck. General characteristics. Class and type Olympic class ocean liner. Tonnage 46,329 GRT. 21,831 NRT. Displacement 52,310 tons, length 882 feet 9 inches, 269.1 meters, overall, beam 92 feet 6 inches, 28.2 m, height 175 feet, 53.3 meters, keel to top of funnels, draft 34 feet 7 inches, 10.5 m, depth 64 feet 6 inches, 19.7 m, decks 9, IG. Installed power 24 double-ended and 5 single-ended boilers feeding two reciprocating steam engines for the wing propellers, and a low-pressure turbine for the center propeller, output, 46,000 hp, propulsion, two three-blade wing propellers and one center propeller, speed cruising, 21 knots, 39 km per hour, 24 miles per hour, max, 23 knots, 43 km per hour, 26 miles per hour, capacity passengers, 2,453, crew, 874. Total, 3,327, or 3,547 according to other sources. Notes lifeboats, 20, sufficient for 1,178 people. RMS Titanic was a British passenger liner, operated by the White Star Line, that sank in the North Atlantic Ocean on April 15. 1912 after striking an iceberg during her maiden voyage from Southampton, England, to New York City, United States. Of the estimated 2,224 passengers and crew aboard, more than 1,500 died, making it the deadliest sinking of a single ship up to that time. It remains the deadliest peacetime sinking of an ocean liner or cruise ship. The disaster drew public attention, spurred major changes in maritime safety regulations, and inspired many artistic works. RMS Titanic was the largest ship afloat at the time she entered service and the second of three Olympic-class ocean liners built for the White Star Line. She was built by the Harland & Wolfe Shipyard in Belfast. Thomas Andrews, the chief naval architect of the shipyard, died in the disaster. Titanic was under the command of Captain Edward Smith, who went down with the ship. The ocean liner carried some of the wealthiest people in the world, as well as hundreds of emigrants from the British Isles, Scandinavia, and elsewhere throughout Europe, who were seeking a new life in the United States and Canada. The first-class accommodation was designed to be the pinnacle of comfort and luxury, with a gymnasium, swimming pool, smoking rooms, high-class restaurants and cafes, a Turkish bath, and hundreds of opulent cabins. A high-powered radio telegraph transmitter was available for sending passenger Marconi grams and for the ship's operational use. Titanic had advanced safety features, 
such as watertight compartments and remotely activated watertight doors, contributing to its reputation as unsinkable. Titanic was equipped with 16 lifeboat davits, each capable of lowering three lifeboats, for a total of 48 boats. However, she actually carried only 20 lifeboats, four of which were collapsible and proved hard to launch while she was sinking, collapsible A nearly swamped and was filled with a foot of water until rescue, collapsible B completely overturned while launching. Together, the 20 lifeboats could hold 1,178 people, about half the number of passengers on board, and one-third of the number of passengers the ship could have carried at full capacity, a number consistent with the maritime safety regulations of the era. When the ship sank, the lifeboats that had been lowered were only filled up to an average of 60%. Gaumont Newsreel, containing the only known footage of Titanic, 1912.
Background The name Titanic derives from the titans of Greek mythology. Built in Belfast, Ireland, in what was then the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, RMS Titanic was the second of the three Olympic-class ocean liners. The lead vessel was RMS Olympic and the final ship in the class was HMHS Britannic. They were by far the largest vessels of the British shipping company White Star Lines fleet, which comprised 29 steamers and tenders in 1912. The three ships had their genesis in a discussion in mid-1907 between the White Star Lines chairman, J. Bruce Ismay, and the American financier J. P. Morgan, who controlled the White Star Lines parent corporation, the International Mercantile Marine Company, IMM. The White Star Line faced an increasing challenge from its main rivals, Cunard, which had recently launched Lusitania and Mauritania, the fastest passenger ships then in service, and the German lines Hamburg America and Norddeutscher Lloyd. Ismay preferred to compete on size rather than speed and proposed to commission a new class of liners that would be larger than anything that had gone before, as well as being the last word in comfort and luxury. The White Star Line sought an upgrade of its fleet primarily to respond to the introduction of the Cunard Giants, but also to considerably strengthen its position on the Southampton, Cherbourg, New York service that had been inaugurated in 1907. The new ships would have sufficient speed to maintain a weekly service with only three ships instead of the original four. Thus, the Olympic and Titanic would replace RMS Teutonic of 1889. RMS Majestic of 1890 as well as RMS Adriatic of 1907. RMS Oceanic would remain on the route until the third new ship could be delivered, citation needed, Majestic resumed her old position on the White Star Line's New York service post the loss of Titanic. The ships were constructed by the Belfast shipbuilder Harland & Wolfe, which had a long-established relationship with the White Star Line dating back to 1867. Harland and Wolfe were given a great deal of latitude in designing ships for the White Star Line. The usual approach was for Wilhelm Wolfe to sketch a general concept, which Edward James Harland would turn into a ship design. Cost considerations were a relatively low priority. Harland and Wolfe were authorized to spend what it needed on the ships, plus a 5% profit margin. In the case of the Olympic-class ships, a cost of £3 million, approximately £310 million in 2019, for the first two ships was agreed plus extras to contract and the usual 5% fee. Harland and Wolf put their leading designers to work designing Olympic-class vessels. The design was overseen by Lord Peary, a director of both Harland and Wolf and the White Star Line, naval architect Thomas Andrews, the managing director of Harland and Wolf's design department, Edward Wilding, Andrews's deputy and responsible for calculating the ship's design, stability and trim, and Alexander Carlyle, the shipyard's chief draftsman and general manager. Carlyle's responsibilities included the decorations, equipment, and all general arrangements including the implementation of an efficient lifeboat davit design. On July 29, 1908, Harland and Wolfe presented the drawings to J. Bruce Ismay and other White Star Line executives. Ismay approved the design and signed three letters of agreement two days later, authorizing the start of construction. At this point, the first ship, which was later to become Olympic, had no name but was referred to simply as Number 400, as it was Harland and Wolfe's 400th hull. Titanic was based on a revised version of the same design and was given the Number 401. Dimensions and Layout Starboard View of Titanic Titanic was 882 feet 9 inches, 269.06 meters, long with a maximum breadth of 92 feet 6 inches, 28.19 meters. Her total height, measured from the base of the keel to the top of the bridge, was 104 feet 32 meters. She measured 46,329 GRT and 21,831 NRT and with a draft of 34 feet 7 inches, 10.54 meters, 
she displaced 52,310 tons. All three of the Olympic-class ships had ten decks, excluding the top of the officers' quarters, eight of which were for passenger use. From top to bottom, the decks were the boat deck on which the lifeboats were housed. It was from here during the early hours of April 15, 1912 that Titanic's lifeboats were lowered into the North Atlantic. The bridge and wheelhouse were at the forward end, in front of the captain's and officer's quarters. The bridge stood 8 feet, 2.4 meters, above the deck, extending out to either side so that the ship could be controlled while docking. The wheelhouse stood within the bridge. The entrance to the first-class grand staircase and gymnasium were located midships along with the raised roof of the first-class lounge, while at the rear of the deck were the roof of the first-class smoke room and the relatively modest second-class entrance. The wood-covered deck was divided into four segregated promenades, four officers, first-class passengers, engineers, and second-class passengers, respectively. Lifeboats lined the side of the deck except in the first-class area, where there was a gap so that the view would not be spoiled. A deck, also called the promenade deck, extended along the entire 546 feet 166 meters, length of the superstructure. It was reserved exclusively for first-class passengers and contained first-class cabins, the first-class lounge, smoke room, reading and writing rooms, and palm court. B deck, the bridge deck, was the top weight-bearing deck and the uppermost level of the hull. More first-class passenger accommodations were located here with six palatial staterooms, cabins, featuring their own private promenades. On Titanic, the a la carte restaurant and the Café Parisien provided luxury dining facilities to first-class passengers. Both were run by subcontracted chefs and their staff, all were lost in the disaster. The second-class smoking room and entrance hall were both located on this deck. The raised forecastle of the ship was forward of the bridge deck, accommodating number one hatch, the main hatch through to the cargo holds, numerous pieces of machinery and the anchor housings. Aft of the bridge deck was the raised poop deck, 106 feet 32 meters long, used as a promenade by third-class passengers. It was where many of Titanic's passengers and crew made their last stand as the ship sank. The forecastle and poop deck were separated from the bridge deck by well decks. Sea deck, the shelter deck, was the highest deck to run uninterrupted from stem to stern. It included both well decks, the aft one served as part of the third-class promenade. Crew cabins were housed below the forecastle and third-class public rooms were housed below the poop deck. In between were the majority of first-class cabins and the second-class library. D deck, the saloon deck, was dominated by three large public rooms, the first-class reception room, the first-class dining saloon and the second-class dining saloon. An open space was provided for third-class passengers. First, second and third-class passengers had cabins on this deck, with berths for firemen located in the bow. It was the highest level reached by the ship's watertight bulkheads, though only by aid of the fifteen bulkheads. E deck, the upper deck, was predominantly used for passenger accommodation for all three classes plus berths for cooks, seamen, stewards and trimmers. Along its length ran a long passageway nicknamed Scotland Road, in reference to a famous street in Liverpool. Scotland Road was used by third-class passengers and crew members. F Deck, the middle deck, was the last complete deck, and mainly accommodated second- and third-class passengers and several departments of the crew. The third-class dining saloon was located here, as were the swimming pool, Turkish bath and kennels. G deck, the lower deck, was the lowest complete deck that carried passengers and had the lowest portholes, just above the waterline. The squash court was located here along with the traveling post office where letters and parcels were sorted ready for delivery when the ship docked. Food was also stored here. The deck was interrupted at several points by orlop, partial, decks over the boiler, engine and turbine rooms.
the orlop decks, and the tank top below that, were on the lowest level of the ship, below the waterline. The orlop decks were used as cargo spaces, while the tank top, the inner bottom of the ship's hull, provided the platform on which the ship's boilers, engines, turbines and electrical generators were housed. This area of the ship was occupied by the engine and boiler rooms, areas which passengers would have been prohibited from seeing. They were connected with higher levels of the ship by flights of stairs, twin spiral stairways near the bow provided access up to D-deck. Features Power RMS Olympics rudder with central and port wing propellers, the man at the bottom shows scale. Titanic propulsion was supplied by three main engines, two reciprocating four-cylinder, triple expansion steam engines and one centrally placed low-pressure Parsons turbine, each driving a propeller. The two reciprocating engines had a combined output of 30,000 horsepower, 22,000 kilowatts. The output of the steam turbine was 16,000 horsepower, 12,000 kilowatts. The White Star Line had used the same combination of engines on an earlier liner, Laurentic, where it had been a great success. It provided a good combination of performance and speed, reciprocating engines by themselves were not powerful enough to propel an Olympic-class liner at the desired speeds, while turbines were sufficiently powerful but caused uncomfortable vibrations, a problem that affected the all-turbine Cunard liners Lusitania and Mauritania. By combining reciprocating engines with a turbine, fuel usage could be reduced and motive power increased, while using the same amount of steam. The two reciprocating engines were each 63 feet, 19 meters, long and weighed 720 tons, with their bed plates contributing a further 195 tons. They were powered by steam produced in 29 boilers, 24 of which were double-ended and five single-ended which contained a total of 159 furnaces. The boilers were 15 feet 9 inches, 4.80 meters, in diameter and 20 feet, 6.1 meters, long, each weighing 91.5 tons and capable of holding 48.5 tons of water. They were fueled by burning coal, 6,611 tons of which could be carried in Titanic's bunkers with a further 1,092 tons in hold 3. The furnaces required over 600 tons of coal a day to be shoveled into them by hand, requiring the services of 176 firemen working around the clock. 100 tons of ash a day had to be disposed of by ejecting it into the sea. The work was relentless, dirty and dangerous, and although firemen were paid relatively well, there was a high suicide rate among those who worked in that capacity. Exhaust steam leaving the reciprocating engines was fed into the turbine, which was situated aft. From there it passed into a surface condenser, to increase the efficiency of the turbine and so that the steam could be condensed back into water and reused. The engines were attached directly to long shafts which drove the propellers. There were three, one for each engine, the outer, or wing, propellers were the largest, each carrying three blades of manganese bronze alloy with a total diameter of 23.5 feet, 7.2 meters. The middle propeller was slightly smaller at 17 feet, 5.2 meters, in diameter, and could be stopped but not reversed. Titanic's electrical plant was capable of producing more power than an average city power station of the time. Immediately aft of the turbine engine were four 400 kW steam-driven electric generators, used to provide electrical power to the ship, plus two 30 kW auxiliary generators for emergency use. Their location in the stern of the ship meant they remained operational until the last few minutes before the ship sank. Titanic lacked a searchlight in accordance with the ban on the use of searchlights in the Merchant Navy. Technology, Compartments and Funnels The interiors of the Olympic-class ships were subdivided into 16 primary compartments divided by 15 bulkheads that extended above the waterline. Eleven vertically closing watertight doors could seal off the compartments in the event of an emergency. 
The ship's exposed decking was made of pine and teak, while interior ceilings were covered in painted granulated cork to combat condensation. Standing above the decks were four funnels, each painted buff with black tops, only three were functional, the aftmost one was a dummy, installed for aesthetic purposes and kitchen ventilation. Two masts, each 155 feet, 47 meters high, supported derricks for working cargo. Rudder and steering engines. Due to the size and weight of Titanic's rudder, at 78 feet 8 inches, 23.98 meters high and 15 feet 3 inches, 4.65 meters long, weighing over 100 tons, that it required steering engines to move it. Two steam-powered steering engines were installed, though only one was used at any one time, with the other one kept in reserve. They were connected to the short tiller through stiff springs, to isolate the steering engines from any shocks in heavy seas or during fast changes of direction. As a last resort, the tiller could be moved by ropes connected to two steam capstans. The capstans were also used to raise and lower the ship's five anchors, one port, one starboard, one in the centerline and two kedging anchors. Water, Ventilation and Heating The ship was equipped with her own waterworks, capable of heating and pumping water to all parts of the vessel via a complex network of pipes and valves. The main water supply was taken aboard while Titanic was in port, but in an emergency, the ship could also distill fresh water from seawater, though this was not a straightforward process as the distillation plant quickly became clogged by salt deposits. A network of insulated ducts conveyed warm air, driven by electric fans, around the ship, and first-class cabins were fitted with additional electric heaters. Radio Communications Marconi Company receiving equipment for a 5-kilowatt ocean liner station, in the picture, the wireless radio room of Titanic's sister ship, Olympic, the only known picture of Titanic's wireless radio room, taken by the Catholic priest Francis Brown. Harold Bride is seated at the desk. Titanic's radio telegraph equipment, then known as wireless telegraphy, was leased to the White Star Line by the Marconi International Marine Communication Company, which also supplied two of its employees, Jack Phillips and Harold Bride, as operators. The service maintained a 24-hour schedule, primarily sending and receiving passenger telegrams, Marconi grams, but also handling navigation messages including weather reports and ice warnings. The radio room was located on the boat deck, in the officers' quarters. A soundproofed silent room, next to the operating room, housed loud equipment, including the transmitter and a motor generator used for producing alternating currents. The operators' living quarters were adjacent to the working office. The ship was equipped with a state-of-the-art 5-kilowatt rotary spark gap transmitter, with the wireless telegraph call sign MGY and communication was in Morse code. This transmitter was one of the first Marconi installations to use a rotary spark gap, which gave Titanic a distinctive musical tone that could be readily distinguished from other signals. The transmitter was one of the most powerful in the world and guaranteed to broadcast over a radius of 350 miles, 304 nmi, 563 kilometers. An elevated T antenna that spanned the length of the ship was used for transmitting and receiving. The normal operating frequency was 500 kHz, 600 m wavelength, however, the equipment could also operate on the short wavelength of 1000 kHz, 300 m wavelength, that was employed by smaller vessels with shorter antennas. Passenger Facilities Main Articles first-class facilities of the Titanic and second- and third-class facilities on Titanic. See also, Grand Staircase of Titanic. The passenger facilities aboard Titanic aimed to meet the highest standards of luxury. According to Titanic's general arrangement plans, the ship could accommodate 833 first-class passengers, 614 in second-class and 1,006 in third-class for a total passenger capacity of 2,453. In addition, her capacity for crew members exceeded 900, 
as most documents of her original configuration have stated that her full carrying capacity for both passengers and crew was approximately 3,547. Her interior design was a departure from that of other passenger liners, which had typically been decorated in the rather heavy style of a manor house or an English country house. Titanic was laid out in a much lighter style similar to that of contemporary high-class hotels. The Ritz Hotel was a reference point, with first-class cabins finished in the Empire style. A variety of other decorative styles, ranging from the Renaissance to Louis XV, were used to decorate cabins and public rooms in first- and second-class areas of the ship. The aim was to convey an impression that the passengers were in a floating hotel rather than a ship, as one passenger recalled, on entering the ship's interior a passenger would at once lose the feeling that we are on board ship, and seem instead to be entering the hall of some great house on shore. Among the more novel features available to first-class passengers was a 7 feet, 2.1 meters, deep saltwater swimming pool, a gymnasium, a squash court, and a Turkish bath which comprised electric bath, steam room, cool room, massage room, and hot room. First-class common rooms were impressive in scope and lavishly decorated. They included a lounge in the style of the Palace of Versailles, an enormous reception room, a men's smoking room, and a reading and writing room. There was an a la carte restaurant in the style of the Ritz Hotel which was run as a concession by the famous Italian restaurateur Gaspar Gatti. A café Parisian decorated in the style of a French sidewalk café, complete with ivy-covered trellises and wicker furniture, was run as an annex to the restaurant. For an extra cost, first-class passengers could enjoy the finest French haute cuisine in the most luxurious of surroundings. There was also a veranda café where tea and light refreshments were served, that offered grand views of the ocean. At 114 feet 35 meters, long by 92 feet 28 meters wide, the dining saloon on D-Deck, designed by Charles Fitzroy Dahl, was the largest room afloat and could seat almost 600 passengers at a time. The forward first-class, grand staircase of Titanic's sister ship RMS Olympic. Titanic's staircase will have looked nearly identical. No known photos of Titanic's staircase exist. The gymnasium on the boat deck, which was equipped with the latest exercise machine, the a la carte restaurant on B-Deck, pictured here on sister ship RMS Olympic, run as a concession by Italian-born chef Gaspar Gatti. The first-class lounge of RMS Olympic, Titanic's sister ship. The first-class Turkish baths, located along the starboard side of F-Deck. Third class, commonly referred to as steerage, accommodations aboard Titanic were not as luxurious as first or second class but were better than on many other ships of the time. They reflected the improved standards which the White Star Line had adopted for transatlantic immigrant and lower-class travel. On most other North Atlantic passenger ships at the time, third-class accommodations consisted of little more than open dormitories in the forward end of the vessels, in which hundreds of people were confined, often without adequate food or toilet facilities. The White Star Line had long since broken that mold. As seen aboard Titanic, all White Star Line passenger ships divided their third-class accommodations into two sections, always at opposite ends of the vessel from one another. The established arrangement was that single men were quartered in the forward areas, while single women, married couples and families were quartered aft. In addition, while other ships provided only open-berth sleeping arrangements, White Star Line vessels provided their third-class passengers with private, small but comfortable cabins capable of accommodating two, four, six, eight, and ten passengers. Third-class accommodations also included their own dining rooms, as well as public gathering areas including adequate open deck space, which aboard Titanic comprised the poop deck at the stern, the forward and aft well decks, and a large open space on D deck which could be used as a social hall. This was supplemented by the addition of a smoking room for men and a general room on C deck which women could use for reading and writing.
Although they were not as glamorous in design as spaces seen in upper-class accommodations, they were still far above average for the period. Leisure facilities were provided for all three classes to pass the time. As well as making use of the indoor amenities such as the library, smoking rooms, and gymnasium, it was also customary for passengers to socialize on the open deck, promenading or relaxing in higher deck chairs or wooden benches. A passenger list was published before the sailing to inform the public which members of the great and good were on board, and it was not uncommon for ambitious mothers to use the list to identify rich bachelors to whom they could introduce their marriageable daughters during the voyage. One of Titanic's most distinctive features was her first-class staircase, known as the Grand Staircase or Grand Stairway. Built of solid English oak with a sweeping curve, the staircase descended through seven decks of the ship, between the boat deck to E deck, before terminating in a simplified single flight on F deck. It was capped with a dome of wrought iron and glass that admitted natural light to the stairwell. Each landing off the staircase gave access to ornate entrance halls paneled in the William and Mary style and lit by ormolu and crystal light fixtures. At the uppermost landing was a large carved wooden panel containing a clock, with figures of honor and glory crowning time flanking the clock face. The grand staircase was destroyed during the sinking and is now just a void in the ship which modern explorers have used to access the lower decks. During the filming of James Cameron's Titanic in 1997, his replica of the grand staircase was ripped from its foundations by the force of the inrushing water on the set. It has been suggested that during the real event, the entire grand staircase was ejected upwards through the dome. Mail and Cargo La Circassian Obane by Mary Joseph Blondell, the most highly valued item of cargo lost on Titanic. This image is of a copy. Although Titanic was primarily a passenger liner, she also carried a substantial amount of cargo. Her designation as a Royal Mail Ship, RMS, indicated that she carried mail under contract with the Royal Mail, and also for the United States Post Office Department. For the storage of letters, parcels and specie, bullion, coins and other valuables, 26,800 cubic feet, 760 cubic meters, of space in her holds was allocated. The sea post office on G-Deck was manned by five postal clerks, three Americans and two Britons, who worked 13 hours a day, seven days a week, sorting up to 60,000 items daily. The ship's passengers brought with them a huge amount of baggage, another 19,455 cubic feet, 550.9 cubic meters, was taken up by first- and second-class baggage. In addition, there was a considerable quantity of regular cargo, ranging from furniture to foodstuffs, and a 1912 Renault Type CE Coupe de Ville motorcar. Despite later myths, the cargo on Titanic's maiden voyage was fairly mundane, there was no gold, exotic minerals or diamonds, and one of the more famous items lost in the shipwreck, a jeweled copy of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, was valued at only 405 pounds, 42,700 pounds today. According to the claims for compensation filed with Commissioner Gilchrist, following the conclusion of the Senate inquiry, the single most highly valued item of luggage or cargo was a large neoclassical oil painting entitled La Circassienne Aubaine by French artist Mary Joseph Blondel. The painting's owner, first class passenger Moritz Hockenbjornstrom Stephenson, filed a claim for $100,000, equivalent to $2,100,000 in 2021, in compensation for the loss of the artwork. Titanic was equipped with eight electric cranes, four electric winches and three steam winches to lift cargo and baggage in and out of the holds. It is estimated that the ship used some 415 tons of coal whilst in Southampton, simply generating steam to operate the cargo winches and provide heat and light. Lifeboats, main article, lifeboats of Titanic. A collapsible lifeboat with canvas sides. Like Olympic, Titanic carried a total of 20 lifeboats, 
14 standard wooden Harland and Wolf lifeboats with a capacity of 65 people each and 4 Engelhart collapsible, wooden bottom, collapsible canvas sides, lifeboats, identified as A to D, with a capacity of 47 people each. In addition, she had two emergency cutters with a capacity of 40 people each. Olympic carried at least two collapsible boats on either side of her number one funnel. All of the lifeboats were stowed securely on the boat deck and, except for collapsible lifeboats A and B, connected to davits by ropes. Those on the starboard side were odd-numbered 1 to 15 from bow to stern, while those on the port side were even-numbered 2 to 16 from bow to stern. Both cutters were kept swung out, hanging from the davits, ready for immediate use, while collapsible lifeboats C and D were stowed on the boat deck, connected to davits, immediately inboard of boats 1 and 2 respectively. A and B were stored on the roof of the officer's quarters, on either side of number 1 funnel. There were no davits to lower them and their weight would make them difficult to launch by hand. Each boat carried, among other things, food, water, blankets, and a spare life belt. Lifeline ropes on the boat's sides enabled them to save additional people from the water if necessary. Titanic had 16 sets of davits, each able to handle four lifeboats as Carlisle had planned. This gave Titanic the ability to carry up to 64 wooden lifeboats, which would have been enough for 4,000 people, considerably more than her actual capacity. However, the White Star Line decided that only 16 wooden lifeboats and four collapsibles would be carried, which could accommodate 1,178 people, only one-third of Titanic's total capacity. At the time, the Board of Trade's regulations required British vessels over 10,000 tons to only carry 16 lifeboats with a capacity of 990 occupants. Therefore, the White Star Line actually provided more lifeboat accommodation than was legally required. At the time, lifeboats were intended to ferry survivors from a sinking ship to a rescuing ship, not keep afloat the whole population or power them to shore. Had SS Californian responded to Titanic's distress calls, the lifeboats might have been able to ferry all passengers to safety as planned. Building and preparing the ship Construction, launch and fitting out, construction and gantry, bow is seen, construction and gantry, 1909-11, launch, 1911, ship with unfinished superstructure, launch, 1911, unfinished superstructure, fitting out, 1911-12, ship is seen in dock, fitting out, 1911-12, the sheer size of the Olympic-class vessels posed a major engineering challenge for Harland and Wolfe no shipbuilder had ever before attempted to construct vessels this size. The ships were constructed on Queen's Island, now known as the Titanic Quarter, in Belfast Harbor. Harland and Wolfe had to demolish three existing slipways and build two new ones, the largest ever constructed up to that time, to accommodate both ships. Their construction was facilitated by an enormous gantry built by Sir William Errol and Company a Scottish firm responsible for the building of the Fourth Bridge and London's Tower Bridge. The Errol Gantry stood 228 feet 69 meters high, was 270 feet 82 meters wide and 840 feet 260 meters long, and weighed more than 6,000 tons. It accommodated a number of mobile cranes. A separate floating crane, capable of lifting 200 tons, was brought in from Germany. The construction of Olympic and Titanic took place virtually in parallel, with Olympic's keel laid down first on December 16, 1908 and Titanic's on March 31, 1909. Both ships took about 26 months to build and followed much the same construction process. They were designed essentially as an enormous floating box girder, with the keel acting as a backbone and the frames of the hull forming the ribs. At the base of the ships, a double bottom 5 feet 3 inches, 1.60 meters, deep supported 300 frames, each between 24 inches, 61 centimeters, and 36 inches, 91 centimeters, apart and measuring up to about 66 feet, 
20 meters long. They terminated at the bridge deck, B deck, and were covered with steel plates which formed the outer skin of the ships. The 2,000 hull plates were single pieces of rolled steel plate, mostly up to 6 feet 1.8 meters, wide and 30 feet 9.1 meters, long and weighing between 2.5 and 3 tons. Their thickness varied from 1 inch 2.5 centimeters to 1.5 inches 3.8 centimeters. The plates were laid in a clinkered, overlapping, fashion from the keel to the bilge. Above that point they were laid in the in-and-out fashion, where strake plating was applied in bands, the in-strakes, with the gaps covered by the out-strakes, overlapping on the edges. Commercial oxy-fuel and electric arc welding methods, ubiquitous in fabrication today, were still in their infancy, like most other iron and steel structures of the era, the hull was held together with over three million iron and steel rivets, which by themselves weighed over 1,200 tons. They were fitted using hydraulic machines or were hammered in by hand. 80. In the 1990s some material scientists concluded that the steel plate used for the ship was subject to being especially brittle when cold, and that this brittleness exacerbated the impact damage and hastened the sinking. It is believed that, by the standards of the time, the steel plate's quality was good, not faulty but that it was inferior to what would be used for shipbuilding purposes in later decades, owing to advances in the metallurgy of steelmaking. As for the rivets, considerable emphasis has also been placed on their quality and strength. Among the last items to be fitted on Titanic before the ship's launch were her two side anchors and one center anchor. The anchors themselves were a challenge to make with the center anchor being the largest ever forged by hand and weighing nearly 16 tons. Twenty Clydesdale draft horses were needed to haul the center anchor by wagon from the Noah Hingley and Sons LTD Forge Shop in Netherton, near Dudley, United Kingdom, to the Dudley Railway Station, two miles away. From there it was shipped by rail to Fleetwood in Lancashire before being loaded aboard a ship and sent to Belfast. The work of constructing the ships was difficult and dangerous. For the 15,000 men who worked at Harland and Wolf at the time, safety precautions were rudimentary at best, a lot of the work was carried out without equipment like hard hats or hand guards on machinery. As a result, during Titanic's construction, 246 injuries were recorded, 28 of them severe, such as arms severed by machines or legs crushed under falling pieces of steel. Six people died on the ship herself while she was being constructed and fitted out, and another two died in the shipyard workshops and sheds. Just before the launch a worker was killed when a piece of wood fell on him. Titanic was launched at 12.15 p.m. on May 31, 1911 in the presence of Lord Peary, J., Pierpont Morgan, J., a Bruce Ismay and 100,000 onlookers. Twenty-two tons of soap and tallow were spread on the slipway to lubricate the ship's passage into the River Lagan. In keeping with the White Star Line's traditional policy, the ship was not formally named or christened with champagne. The ship was towed to a fitting-out berth where, over the course of the next year, her engines, Funnels and superstructure were installed and her interior was fitted out. Although Titanic was virtually identical to the class's lead ship Olympic, a few changes were made to distinguish both ships. The most noticeable exterior difference was that Titanic, and the third vessel in class, Britannic, had a steel screen with sliding windows installed along the forward half of the A-deck promenade. This was installed as a last-minute change at the personal request of Bruce Ismay, and was intended to provide additional shelter to first-class passengers. Extensive changes were made to be deck on Titanic as the promenade space in this deck, which had proven unpopular on Olympic, was converted into additional first-class cabins, including two opulent parlor suites with their own private promenade spaces. The à la carte restaurant was also enlarged and the Café Parisien, an entirely new feature which did not exist on Olympic, was added. These changes made Titanic slightly heavier than her sister, and thus she could claim to be the largest ship afloat. 
The work took longer than expected due to design changes requested by Ismay and a temporary pause in work occasioned by the need to repair Olympic, which had been in a collision in September 1911. Had Titanic been finished earlier, she might well have missed her collision with an iceberg. Sea Trials Titanic departing Belfast for sea trials on April 2, 1912. Titanic sea trials began at 6 a.m. on Tuesday, April 2, 1912, just two days after her fitting out was finished and eight days before she was due to leave Southampton on her maiden voyage. The trials were delayed for a day due to bad weather, but by Monday morning it was clear and fair. Aboard were 78 stokers, greasers and firemen, and 41 members of crew. No domestic staff appear to have been aboard. Representatives of various companies traveled on Titanic's sea trials, Thomas Andrews and Edward Wilding of Harland and & Wolfe, and Harold A. Sanderson of IMM. Bruce Ismay and Lord Peary were too ill to attend. Jack Phillips and Harold Bride served as radio operators and performed fine-tuning of the Marconi equipment. Francis Carruthers, a surveyor from the Board of Trade, was also present to see that everything worked and that the ship was fit to carry passengers. The sea trials consisted of a number of tests of her handling characteristics, carried out first in Belfast Lock and then in the open waters of the Irish Sea. Over the course of about 12 hours, Titanic was driven at different speeds, her turning ability was tested and a crash stop was performed in which the engines were reversed full ahead to full astern bringing her to a stop in 850 yards, 777 meters, or 3 minutes and 15 seconds. The ship covered a distance of about 80 nautical miles, 92 miles, 150 kilometers, averaging 18 knots, 21 miles per hour, 33 kilometers per hour, and reaching a maximum speed of just under 21 knots, 24 miles per hour, 39 kilometers per hour. On returning to Belfast at about 7 p.m., the surveyor signed an agreement and account of voyages and crew, valid for 12 months, which declared the ship seaworthy. An hour later, Titanic departed Belfast to head to Southampton, a voyage of about 570 nautical miles, 660 miles, 1,060 kilometers. After a journey lasting about 28 hours, she arrived about midnight on April 4 and was towed to the port's berth 44, ready for the arrival of her passengers and the remainder of her crew. Maiden Voyage Titanic at Southampton Docks, prior to departure. Titanic in Cork Harbor, April 11, 1912. Both Olympic and Titanic registered Liverpool as their home port. The offices of the White Star Line, as well as Cunard, were in Liverpool, and up until the introduction of the Olympic, most British ocean liners for both Cunard and White Star, such as Lusitania and Mauritania, sailed from Liverpool followed by a port of call in Queenstown, Ireland. Since the company's founding in 1845, a vast majority of their operations had taken place from Liverpool. However, in 1907 White Star Line established another service from Southampton on England's south coast, which became known as White Star's Express Service. Southampton had many advantages over Liverpool, the first being its proximity to London. In addition, Southampton, being on the south coast, allowed ships to easily cross the English Channel and make a port of call on the northern coast of France, usually at Cherbourg. This allowed British ships to pick up clientele from continental Europe before recrossing the Channel and picking up passengers at Queenstown. The southampton Cherbourg, new York run would become so popular that most British ocean liners began using the port after World War I. Out of respect for Liverpool, ships continued to be registered there until the early 1960s. Queen Elizabeth II was one of the first ships registered in Southampton when introduced into service by Cunard in 1969. Titanic's maiden voyage was intended to be the first of many transatlantic crossings between Southampton and New York via Cherbourg and Queenstown on westbound runs, returning via Plymouth in England while eastbound. Indeed, her entire schedule of voyages through to December 1912 still exists.
when the route was established, four ships were assigned to the service. In addition to Teutonic and Majestic, RMS Oceanic and the brand new RMS Adriatic sailed the route. When the Olympic entered service in June 1911, she replaced Teutonic, which after completing her last run on the service in late April was transferred to the Dominion Lines Canadian service. The following August, Adriatic was transferred to White Star Line's main Liverpool New York service, and in November, Majestic was withdrawn from service impending the arrival of Titanic in the coming months, and was mothballed as a reserve ship. White Star Line's initial plans for Olympic and Titanic on the Southampton run followed the same routine as their predecessors had done before them. Each would sail once every three weeks from Southampton and New York, usually leaving at noon each Wednesday from Southampton and each Saturday from New York, thus enabling the White Star Line to offer weekly sailings in each direction. Special trains were scheduled from London and Paris to convey passengers to Southampton and Cherbourg respectively. The deepwater dock at Southampton, then known as the White Star Dock, had been specially constructed to accommodate the new Olympic-class liners and had opened in 1911. Crew, main article, crew of Titanic. Edward Smith, captain of Titanic, in 1911, Titanic had around 885 crew members on board for her maiden voyage. Like other vessels of her time, she did not have a permanent crew, and the vast majority of crew members were casual workers who only came aboard the ship a few hours before she sailed from Southampton. The process of signing up recruits had begun on March 23 and some had been sent to Belfast, where they served as a skeleton crew during Titanic sea trials and passage to England at the start of April. Captain Edward John Smith, the most senior of the White Star Line's captains, was transferred from Olympic to take command of Titanic. Henry Tingle Wilde also came across from Olympic to take the post of chief mate. Titanic's previously designated chief mate and first officer, William McMaster Murdoch and Charles Lightoller, were bumped down to the ranks of first and second officer respectively. The original second officer, David Blair, was dropped altogether. The third officer was Herbert Pittman MBE, the only deck officer who was not a member of the Royal Naval Reserve. Pittman was the second-to-last surviving officer. Titanic's crew were divided into three principal departments, deck, with 66 crew, engine, with 325, and vittling, with 494. The vast majority of the crew were thus not seamen but were either engineers, firemen, or stokers, responsible for looking after the engines, or stewards and galley staff, responsible for the passengers. Of these, over 97% were male, just 23 of the crew were female, mainly stewardesses. The rest represented a great variety of professions, bakers, chefs, butchers, fishmongers, dishwashers, stewards, gymnasium instructors, laundrymen, waiters, bedmakers, cleaners, and even a printer, who produced a daily newspaper for passengers called the Atlantic Daily Bulletin with the latest news received by the ship's wireless operators. Most of the crew signed on in Southampton on April 6, in all, 699 of the crew came from there, and 40% were natives of the town. A few specialist staff were self-employed or were subcontractors. These included the five postal clerks, who worked for the Royal Mail and the United States Post Office Department, the staff of the First Class à la carte restaurant and the Café Parisien, the radio operators, who were employed by Marconi, and the eight musicians, who were employed by an agency and traveled as second-class passengers. Crew pay varied greatly, from Captain Smith's £105 a month, equivalent to £11,100 today, to the £3.10s, £370 pound today, that stewardesses earned. The lower-paid vittling staff could, however, supplement their wages substantially through tips from passengers. Passengers. Main article, Passengers of Titanic. 
John Jacob Astor IV in 1909. He was the wealthiest person aboard Titanic, he did not survive. Titanic's passengers numbered approximately 1,317 people, 324 in first class, 284 in second class, and 709 in third class. Of these, 869, 66%, were male and 447, 34%, female. There were 107 children aboard, the largest number of whom were in third class. The ship was considerably under capacity on her maiden voyage, as she could accommodate 2,453 passengers, 833 first class, 614 second class, and 1,006 third class. Usually, a high-prestige vessel like Titanic could expect to be fully booked on its maiden voyage. However, a national coal strike in the UK had caused considerable disruption to shipping schedules in the spring of 1912, causing many crossings to be cancelled. Many would-be passengers chose to postpone their travel plans until the strike was over. The strike had finished a few days before Titanic sailed, however, that was too late to have much of an effect. Titanic was able to sail on the scheduled date only because coal was transferred from other vessels which were tied up at Southampton, such as SS City of New York and RMS Oceanic, as well as coal that Olympic had brought back from a previous voyage to New York, which had been stored at the White Star Dock. Some of the most prominent people of the day booked a passage aboard Titanic, traveling in first class. Among them, with those who perished marked with a dagger, were the American millionaire John Jacob Astor IV and his wife, Madeline Force Astor, with John Jacob Astor VI in utero, industrialist Benjamin Guggenheim, painter and sculptor Francis Davis Millet, Macy's owner Isidore Strauss and his wife, Ida, Denver millionaireess Margaret Molly Brown, Sir Cosmo Duff Gordon and his wife, Couturier Lucy, Lady Duff Gordon, Lieutenant Colonel Arthur Puchin, writer and historian Archibald Gracie, cricketer and businessman John B. Thayer with his wife, Marion, and son Jack, George Dunton Widener with his wife, Eleanor, and son Harry, Noel Leslie, Countess of Rothes, Mr. and Mrs. Charles M. Hayes, Mr. and Mrs. Henry S. Harper, Mr. and Mrs. Walter D. Douglas, Mr. and Mrs. George D. Wick, Mr. and Mrs. Henry B. Harris, Mr. and Mrs. Arthur L. Ryerson. Mr. and Mrs. Hudson J. C. Allison, Mr. and Mrs. Dickinson Bishop, noted architect Edward Austin Kent, brewery heir Harry Molson, tennis players Carl Bear and Dick Williams, author and socialite Helen Churchill Candy, future lawyer and suffragette Elsie Bowerman and her mother Edith, journalist and social reformer William Thomas Stead, journalist and fashion buyer Edith Rosenbaum. Philadelphia and New York socialite Edith Corse Evans, wealthy divorcee Charlotte Drake Cardeza, French sculptor Paul Chevre, author Jacques Futrell with his wife May, silent film actress Dorothy Gibson with her mother Pauline, president of the Swiss Bank Verein, Colonel Alphonse Simonius Bloomer, James A. Hughes's daughter Eloise, banker Robert Williams Daniel, the chairman of the Holland America Line, Johann Reuchlin, De. Arthur Wellington Ross's son John H. Ross, Washington Roebling's nephew Washington A. Roebling II, Andrew Sachs's daughter Layla Sachs Meyer with her husband Edgar Joseph Meyer, son of Mark Eugene Meyer, William A. Clark's nephew Walter M. Clark, with his wife, Virginia, a great-great-grandson of soap manufacturer Andrew Pears, Thomas C. Pears, with wife, John S., Pillsbury's honeymooning grandson John P. Snyder and wife Nellie, Dorothy Parker's New York manufacturer Uncle Martin Rothschild with his wife, Elizabeth, and many others. Titanic's owner J. P. Morgan was scheduled to travel on the maiden voyage but cancelled at the last minute. Also aboard the ship were the White Star Line's managing director J. Bruce Ismay and Titanic's designer Thomas Andrews, who was on board to observe any problems and assess the general performance of the new ship. The exact number of people aboard is not known, as not all of those who had booked tickets made it to the ship, 
about 50 people cancelled for various reasons, and not all of those who boarded stayed aboard for the entire journey. Fares varied depending on class and season. Third-class fares from London, Southampton, or Queenstown cost £7.5, equivalent to £800 today, while the cheapest first-class fares cost £23, £2,400 today. The most expensive first-class suites were to have cost up to £870 in high season, £92,000 today. Collecting Passengers Titanic's maiden voyage began on Wednesday, April 10, 1912. Following the embarkation of the crew, the passengers began arriving at 9.30 a.m., when the London and Southwestern Railways boat train from London Waterloo Station reached Southampton Terminus Railway Station on the quayside, alongside Titanic's berth. The large number of third-class passengers meant they were the first to board, with first- and second-class passengers following up to an hour before departure. Stewards showed them to their cabins, and first-class passengers were personally greeted by Captain Smith. Third-class passengers were inspected for ailments and physical impairments that might lead to their being refused entry to the United States, a prospect the White Star Line wished to avoid, as it would have to carry anyone who failed the examination back across the Atlantic. In all, 920 passengers boarded Titanic at Southampton, 179 first class, 247 second class, and 494 third class. Additional passengers were to be picked up at Cherbourg and Queenstown. The maiden voyage began at noon, as scheduled. An accident was narrowly averted only a few minutes later as Titanic passed the moored liners SS City of New York of the American Line and Oceanic of the White Star Line, the latter of which would have been her running mate on the service from Southampton. Her huge displacement caused both of the smaller ships to be lifted by a bulge of water and then dropped into a trough. New York's mooring cables could not take the sudden strain and snapped, swinging her around stern first towards Titanic. A nearby tugboat, Vulcan, came to the rescue by taking New York under tow, and Captain Smith ordered Titanic's engines to be put full astern. The two ships avoided a collision by a distance of about 4 feet, 1.2 meters. The incident delayed Titanic's departure for about an hour, while the drifting New York was brought under control. After making it safely through the complex tides and channels of Southampton Water and the Solent, Titanic disembarked the Southampton pilot at the NAB lightship and headed out into the English Channel. She headed for the French port of Cherbourg, a journey of 77 nautical miles, 89 miles, 143 kilometers. The weather was windy, very fine, but cold and overcast. Because Cherbourg lacked docking facilities for a ship the size of Titanic, tenders had to be used to transfer passengers from shore to ship. The White Star Line operated too at Cherbourg, SS Traffic and SS Nomadic. Both had been designed specifically as tenders for the Olympic-class liners and were launched shortly after Titanic. Nomadic is the only surviving White Star Line ship, for hours after Titanic left Southampton, she arrived at Cherbourg and was met by the tenders. There, 274 additional passengers were taken aboard, 142 first class, 30 second class, and 102 third class. 24 passengers left aboard the tenders to be conveyed to shore, having booked only a cross-channel passage. The process was completed within only 90 minutes and at 8 p.m. Titanic weighed anchor and left for Queenstown with the weather continuing cold and windy. At 11.30 a.m. on Thursday, April 11, Titanic arrived at Cork Harbour on the south coast of Ireland. It was a partly cloudy but relatively warm day, with a brisk wind. Again, the dock facilities were not suitable for a ship of Titanic's size, and tenders were used to bring passengers aboard. In all, 123 passengers boarded Titanic at Queenstown, 3 first class, 7 second class and 1 13 third class. In addition to the 24 cross-channel passengers who had disembarked at Cherbourg, 
another seven passengers had booked an overnight passage from Southampton to Queenstown. Among the seven was Francis Brown, a Jesuit trainee who was a keen photographer and took many photographs aboard Titanic, including one of the last known photographs of the ship. The very last one was taken by another cross-channel passenger Kate O'Dell. A decidedly unofficial departure was that of a crew member, Stoker John Coffey, a Queenstown native who sneaked off the ship by hiding under mail bags being transported to shore. Titanic weighed anchor for the last time at 1.30 p.m. and departed on her westward journey across the Atlantic. Atlantic Crossing The Titanic itinerary on the Northern Atlantic, from Fastnet Light, Ireland, to Ambrose Light, New York. Ice warnings prior to the accident of April 14, Titanic was planned to arrive at New York Pier 59 on the morning of April 17. After leaving Queenstown, Titanic followed the Irish coast as far as Fastnet Rock, a distance of some 55 nautical miles, 63 miles, 102 kilometers. From there she traveled 1,620 nautical miles, 1,860 miles, 3,000 kilometers, along a great circle route across the North Atlantic to reach a spot in the ocean known as the corner southeast of Newfoundland, where westbound steamers carried out a change of course. Titanic sailed only a few hours past the corner on a rum line leg of 1,023 nautical miles, 1,177 miles, 1,895 kilometers, to Nantucket Shoals Light when she made her fatal contact with an iceberg. The final leg of the journey would have been 193 nautical miles, 222 miles, 357 kilometers, to Ambrose Light and finally to New York Harbor. From April 11 to local apparent noon the next day, Titanic covered 484 nautical miles, 557 miles, 896 kilometers, the following day, 519 nautical miles, 597 miles, 961 kilometers, and by noon on the final day of her voyage, 546 nautical miles, 628 miles, 1,011 kilometers. From then until the time of her sinking, she traveled another 258 nautical miles, 297 miles, 478 kilometers, averaging about 21 knots, 24 miles per hour, 39 kilometers per hour. The weather cleared as she left Ireland under cloudy skies with a headwind. Temperatures remained fairly mild on Saturday, April 13, but the following day Titanic crossed a cold weather front with strong winds and waves of up to 8 feet, 2.4 meters. These died down as the day progressed until, by the evening of Sunday, April 14, it became clear, calm, and very cold. The first three days of the voyage from Queenstown had passed without apparent incident. A fire had begun in one of Titanic's coal bunkers approximately ten days prior to the ship's departure, and continued to burn for several days into its voyage, but passengers were unaware of this situation. Fires occurred frequently on board steamships at the time, due to spontaneous combustion of the coal. The fires had to be extinguished with fire hoses by moving the coal on top to another bunker and by removing the burning coal and feeding it into the furnace. The fire was finally extinguished on April 14. There has been some speculation and discussion as to whether this fire and attempts to extinguish it may have made the ship more vulnerable to sinking. Titanic received a series of warnings from other ships of drifting ice in the area of the Grand Banks of Newfoundland, but Captain Smith ignored them. One of the ships to warn Titanic was the Atlantic Line's Misaba. Nevertheless, Titanic continued to steam at full speed, which was standard practice at the time. Although she was not trying to set a speed record, timekeeping was a priority, and under prevailing maritime practices, Ships were often operated at close to full speed, ice warnings were seen as advisories, and reliance was placed upon lookouts and the watch on the bridge. It was generally believed that ice posed little danger to large vessels. Close calls with ice were not uncommon, 
and even head-on collisions had not been disastrous. In 1907, SS Kronprinz Wilhelm, a German liner, had rammed an iceberg but still completed her voyage, and Smith said in 1907 that he could not imagine any condition which would cause a ship to founder. Modern shipbuilding has gone beyond that. Insurance, aid for survivors and lawsuits. Cartoon demanding better safety from shipping companies, 1912. Molly Brown presenting award to Carpathia Captain Arthur Rostron for his service in the rescue. In January 1912, the hulls and equipment of Titanic and Olympic had been insured through Lloyd's of London and London Marine Insurance. The total coverage was £1 million, £102 million today, per ship. The policy was to be free from all average under £150,000, meaning that the insurers would only pay for damage in excess of that sum. The premium, negotiated by brokers Willis Faber and Company, now Willis Group, was 15s, 75p, per £100, or £7,500, £790,000 today, for the term of one year. Lloyd's paid the White Star Line the full sum owed to them within 30 days. Many charities were set up to help the survivors and their families, many of whom lost their sole wage earner, or, in the case of many third-class survivors, everything they owned. In New York City, for example, a joint committee of the American Red Cross and Charity Organization Society formed to disperse financial aid to survivors and dependents of those who died. On April 29, opera stars Enrico Caruso and Mary Garden and members of the Metropolitan Opera raised $12,000, $300,000 in 2014, in benefits for victims of the disaster by giving special concerts in which versions of Autumn and Nearer My God to Thee were part of the program. In Britain, relief funds were organized for the families of Titanic's lost crew members, raising nearly £450,000, £47 million today. One such fund was still in operation as late as the 1960s. In the United States and Britain, more than 60 survivors combined to sue the White Star Line for damages connected to loss of life and baggage. The claims totaled $16,804,112, APPR, $419 million in 2018 USD, which was far in excess of what White Star argued it was responsible for as a limited liability company under American law. Because the bulk of the litigants were in the United States, White Star petitioned the United States Supreme Court in 1914, which ruled in its favor that it qualified as an LLC and found that the causes of the ship's sinking were largely unforeseeable, rather than due to negligence. This sharply limited the scope of damages survivors and family members were entitled to, prompting them to reduce their claims to some $2.5 million. White Star only settled for $664,000, APPR, $16.56 million in 2018, about 27% of the original total sought by survivors. The settlement was agreed to by 44 of the claimants in December 1915, with $500,000 set aside for the American claimants, $50,000 for the British, and $114,000 to go towards interest and legal expenses. Investigations into the disaster Main articles, United States Senate Inquiry into the Sinking of the Titanic and British Rec Commissioner's Inquiry into the Sinking of the Titanic. Senate Inquiry, within five days of the sinking, the New York Times published several columns relating to Ismay's conduct, concerning which there has been so much comment. Columns included the statement of attorney Carl H. Baer indicating Ismay had helped supervise loading of passengers in lifeboats, and of William E. Carter stating that he and Ismay boarded a lifeboat only after there were no more women. Even before the survivors arrived in New York, investigations were being planned to discover what had happened and what could be done to prevent a recurrence. Inquiries were held in both the United States and the United Kingdom the former more robustly critical of traditions and practices, and scathing of the failures involved, and the latter broadly more technical and expert-orientated.
the U.S. Senate's inquiry into the disaster was initiated on April 19, a day after Carpathia arrived in New York. The chairman, Senator William Alden Smith, wanted to gather accounts from passengers and crew while the events were still fresh in their minds. Smith also needed to subpoena all surviving British passengers and crew while they were still on American soil, which prevented them from returning to the UK before the American inquiry was completed on May 25. The British press condemned Smith as an opportunist, insensitively forcing an inquiry as a means of gaining political prestige and seizing his moment to stand on the world stage. Smith, however, already had a reputation as a campaigner for safety on U.S. railroads and wanted to investigate any possible malpractices by railroad tycoon J. P. Morgan, Titanic's ultimate owner. The British Board of Trade's inquiry into the disaster was headed by Lord Mersey and took place between May 2 and July 3. Being run by the Board of Trade, who had previously approved the ship, it was seen by some, like whom, as having little interest in its own or White Star's conduct being found negligent. Each inquiry took testimony from both passengers and crew of Titanic, crew members of Leland Lines Californian, Captain Arthur Rostron of Carpathia and other experts. The British inquiry also took far greater expert testimony, making it the longest and most detailed court of inquiry in British history up to that time. The two inquiries reached broadly similar conclusions. The regulations on the number of lifeboats that ships had to carry were out of date and inadequate, Captain Smith had failed to take proper heat of ice warnings, the lifeboats had not been properly filled or crewed, and the collision was the direct result of steaming into a dangerous area at too high a speed. Neither inquiry's findings listed negligence by IMM or the White Star Line as a factor. The American inquiry concluded that since those involved had followed standard practice, the disaster was an act of God. The British inquiry concluded that Smith had followed long-standing practice that had not previously been shown to be unsafe, noting that British ships alone had carried 3.5 million passengers over the previous decade with the loss of just 10 lives, and concluded that Smith had done only that which other skilled men would have done in the same position. Lord Mirza did, however, find fault with the extremely high speed, 22 knots, which was maintained following numerous ice warnings, noting that what was a mistake in the case of the Titanic would without doubt be negligence in any similar case in the future. The recommendations included strong suggestions for major changes in maritime regulations to implement new safety measures, such as ensuring that more lifeboats were provided, that lifeboat drills were properly carried out and that wireless equipment on passenger ships was manned around the clock. An international ice patrol was set up to monitor the presence of icebergs in the North Atlantic, and maritime safety regulations were harmonized internationally through the International Convention for the Safety of Life at Sea. Both measures are still in force today. On June 18, 1912, Guglielmo Marconi gave evidence to the Court of Inquiry regarding the telegraphy. Its final report recommended that all liners carry the system and that sufficient operators maintain a constant service. The way in which the Titanic sank brought to light serious design issues with the Olympic class. This resulted in the Olympic receiving a major refit and major design changes for the construction of the Britannic. In August 1912, the liner Corsican also struck an iceberg in the Atlantic, severely damaging her bow, however due to the weather being hazy at the time, her speed had been reduced to dead slow, so limiting further damage. Although the lifeboats had been swung out, they were not boarded. Role of SS Californian SS Californian, which had tried to warn Titanic of the danger from pack ice. One of the most controversial issues examined by the inquiries was the role played by SS Californian, which had been only a few miles from Titanic but had not picked up her distress calls or responded to her signal rockets. Californian had stopped for the night because of icy conditions and warned Titanic by radio, but was rebuked by Titanic's senior wireless operator, Jack Phillips. 
testimony before the British inquiry revealed that at 10.10 p.m., Californian observed the lights of a ship to the south, it was later agreed between Captain Stanley Lord and 3rd Officer C.V. Groves, who had relieved Lord of duty at 11.10 p.m., that this was a passenger liner. At 11.50 p.m., the officer had watched that ship's lights flash out, as if she had shut down or turned sharply, and that the port light was now visible. Morse light signals to the ship, upon Lord's order, were made between 11.30 p.m. and 1 a.m., but were not acknowledged. If Titanic was as far from the Californian as Lord claimed, then he knew, or should have known, that Morse signals would not be visible. A reasonable and prudent course of action would have been to awaken the wireless operator and to instruct him to attempt to contact Titanic by that method. Had Lord done so, it is possible he could have reached Titanic in time to save additional lives. Captain Lord had gone to the chart room at 11 p.m. to spend the night, however, 2nd Officer Herbert Stone, now on duty, notified Lord at 1.10 a.m. that the ship had fired five rockets. Lord wanted to know if they were company signals, that is, colored flares used for identification. Stone said that he did not know and that the rockets were all white, clarification needed, Captain Lord instructed the crew to continue to signal the other vessel with the Morse lamp, and went back to sleep. Three more rockets were observed at 1.50 a.m. and Stone noted that the ship looked strange in the water, as if she were listing. At 2.15 a.m., Lord was notified that the ship could no longer be seen. Lord asked again if the lights had had any colors in them, and he was informed that they were all white. Californian eventually responded. At around 5.30 a.m., Chief Officer George Stewart awakened wireless operator Cyril Firmstone Evans, informed him that rockets had been seen during the night, and asked that he try to communicate with any ship. He got news of Titanic's loss, Captain Lord was notified, and the ship set out to render assistance. She arrived well after Carpathia had already picked up all the survivors. The inquiries found that the ship seen by Californian was in fact Titanic and that it would have been possible for Californian to come to her rescue, therefore, Captain Lord had acted improperly in failing to do so. Survivors and Victims Main Article Passengers of the Titanic The number of casualties of the sinking is unclear, because of a number of factors. These include confusion over the passenger list, which included some names of people who cancelled their trip at the last minute, and the fact that several passengers travelled under aliases for various reasons and were therefore double-counted on the casualty lists. The death toll has been put at between 1,490 and 1,635 people. The tables below use figures from the British Board of Trade report on the disaster. While the use of the Marconi wireless system did not achieve the result of bringing a rescue ship to Titanic before it sank, the use of wireless did bring Carpathia in time to rescue some of the survivors who otherwise would have perished due to exposure. The water temperature was well below normal in the area where Titanic sank. It also contributed to the rapid death of many passengers during the sinking. Water temperature readings taken around the time of the accident were reported to be minus 2 degrees Celsius 28 degrees Fahrenheit. Typical water temperatures were normally around 7 degrees Celsius 45 degrees Fahrenheit during mid-April. The coldness of the water was a critical factor, often causing death within minutes for many of those in the water. Fewer than a third of those aboard Titanic survived the disaster. Some survivors died shortly afterwards, injuries and the effects of exposure caused the deaths of several of those brought aboard Carpathia. The figures show stark differences in the survival rates of the different classes aboard Titanic. Although only 3% of first-class women were lost, 54% of those in third class died. Similarly, 5 of 6 first class and all second class children survived, but 52 of the 79 in third class perished. The differences by gender were even bigger, nearly all female crew members, first and second class passengers were saved. 
men from the first class died at a higher rate than women from the third class. In total, 50% of the children survived, 20% of the men and 75% of the women. Thomas Andrews, the chief naval architect of the shipyard, died in the disaster. The last living survivor, Melvina Dean from England, who, at only nine weeks old, was the youngest passenger on board, died aged 97 on May 31, 2009. Two special survivors were the stewardess Violet Jessup and the stoker Arthur John Priest, who survived the sinkings of both Titanic and HMHS Britannic and were aboard RMS Olympic when she was rammed in 1911. Age slash sex class slash crew number aboard number saved number lost percentage saved percentage lost. Children first class 651 83% 17%. Second class 24 100% 0%. Third class 79 27 52 34% 66%. Women first class 144 144 97% 3%. Second class 93 80 13 86% 14%. Third class 165 76 89 46% 54%. Crew 23 23 87% 13%. Men first class 175 57 118 33 67%. Second class 168 14 154 8% 92%. Third class 462 75 387-16%, 84%. Crew 885 192 693 22%, 78%. Total 2224 710 1514 32%, 68%. Retrieval and burial of the dead. Photograph. Markers of Titanic victims, Fairview Cemetery. Halifax, Nova Scotia. Once the massive loss of life became known, White Star Line chartered the cable ship C.S. McKay Bennett from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada, to retrieve bodies. Three other Canadian ships followed in the search, the cable ship Minia, lighthouse supply ship Montmagny and sealing vessel Algerine. Each ship left with embalming supplies, undertakers, and clergy. Of the 333 victims that were eventually recovered, 328 were retrieved by the Canadian ships and five more by passing North Atlantic steamships. The first ship to reach the site of the sinking, the C.S. McKay Bennett, found so many bodies that the embalming supplies aboard were quickly exhausted. Health regulations required that only embalmed bodies could be returned to port. Captain Larnder of the McKay Bennett and undertakers aboard decided to preserve only the bodies of first-class passengers, justifying their decision by the need to visually identify wealthy men to resolve any disputes over large estates. As a result, many third-class passengers and crew were buried at sea. Larnder identified many of those buried at sea as crew members by their clothing, and stated that as a mariner, he himself would be contented to be buried at sea. Bodies recovered were preserved for transport to Halifax, the closest city to the sinking with direct rail and steamship connections. The Halifax Registrar of Vital Statistics, John Henry Barnstead, developed a detailed system to identify bodies and safeguard personal possessions. Relatives from across North America came to identify and claim bodies. A large temporary morgue was set up in the curling rink of the Mayflower Curling Club and undertakers were called in from all across eastern Canada to assist. Some bodies were shipped to be buried in their hometowns across North America and Europe. About two-thirds of the bodies were identified. Unidentified victims were buried with simple numbers based on the order in which their bodies were discovered. The majority of recovered victims, 150 bodies, were buried in three Halifax cemeteries, the largest being Fairview Lawn Cemetery followed by the nearby Mount Olivet and Baron de Hirsch cemeteries. In mid-May 1912, RMS Oceanic recovered three bodies over 200 miles 320 kilometers, from the site of the sinking who were among the original occupants of collapsible A. 
when 5th Officer Harold Lowe and six crewmen returned to the wreck site some time after the sinking in a lifeboat to pick up survivors, they rescued a dozen males and one female from collapsible A, but left the dead bodies of three of its occupants. After their retrieval from collapsible A by Oceanic, the bodies were buried at sea. The last Titanic body recovered was Stuart James McGrady, body number 330, found by the chartered Newfoundland sealing vessel Algerine on May 22 and buried at Fairview Lawn Cemetery in Halifax on June 12. Only 333 bodies of Titanic victims were recovered, which amounted to one in five of the over 1,500 victims. Some bodies sank with the ship while currents quickly dispersed bodies and wreckage across hundreds of miles, making them difficult to recover. By June, one of the last search ships reported that life jackets supporting bodies were coming apart and releasing bodies to sink. Bodies of passengers of the Titanic were numbered as they were brought aboard. Physical characteristics, clothing, identifying marks, and personal effects were all documented. Personal effects were stored separately, labeled with the same body number, and valuables were locked up by the purser. Without enough material or space to handle bodies and their belongings, the crew had to triage. Wreck Main article, Wreck of the Titanic The Bow of Titanic, photographed in June 2004, Titanic was long thought to have sunk in one piece and, over the years, many schemes were put forward for raising the wreck. None came to fruition. The fundamental problem was the sheer difficulty of finding and reaching a wreck that lies over 12,000 feet, 3,700 meters, below the surface, where the water pressure is over 6,000 pounds per square inch, 40 megapascals, comma, dubious to discuss, about 400 standard atmospheres. A number of expeditions were mounted to find Titanic, but it was not until September 1st, 1985 that a Franco-American expedition led by Jean-Louis Michel and Robert Ballard succeeded. The team discovered that Titanic had in fact split apart, probably near or at the surface, before sinking to the seabed. The separated bow and stern sections lie about a third of a mile, 0.6 kilometers, apart in Titanic Canyon off the coast of Newfoundland. They are located 13.2 miles, 21.2 kilometers, from the inaccurate coordinates given by Titanic's radio operators on the night of her sinking, and approximately 715 miles, 1,151 kilometers, from Halifax and 1,250 miles, 2,012 kilometers, from New York. Both sections struck the seabed at considerable speed, causing the bow to crumple and the stern to collapse entirely. The bow is by far the more intact section and still contains some surprisingly intact interiors. In contrast, the stern is completely wrecked, its decks have pancaked down on top of each other and much of the hull plating was torn off and lies scattered across the seafloor. The much greater level of damage to the stern is probably due to structural damage incurred during the sinking. Thus weakened, the remainder of the stern was flattened by the impact with the seabed. The two sections are surrounded by a debris field measuring approximately 5 by 3 miles, 8 kilometers times 5 kilometers. It contains hundreds of thousands of items, such as pieces of the ship, furniture, dinnerware and personal items, which fell from the ship as she sank or were ejected when the bow and stern impacted on the seafloor. The debris field was also the last resting place of a number of Titanic's victims. Most of the bodies and clothes were consumed by sea creatures and bacteria, leaving pairs of shoes and boots, which have proved to be inedible, as the only sign that bodies once lay there. Since its initial discovery, the wreck of Titanic has been revisited on numerous occasions by explorers, scientists, filmmakers, tourists and salvagers, who have recovered thousands of items from the debris field for conservation and public display. The ship's condition has deteriorated significantly over the years, particularly from accidental damage by submersibles but mostly because of an accelerating rate of growth of iron-eating bacteria on the hull.
In 2006, it was estimated that within 50 years the hull and structure of Titanic would eventually collapse entirely, leaving only the more durable interior fittings of the ship intermingled with a pile of rust on the seafloor. The ship's bell, recovered from the wreck. Many artifacts from Titanic have been recovered from the seabed by RMS Titanic Incorporated, which exhibits them in touring exhibitions around the world and in a permanent exhibition at the Luxor Las Vegas Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas, Nevada. A number of other museums exhibit artifacts either donated by survivors or retrieved from the floating bodies of victims of the disaster. On April 16, 2012, the day after the 100th anniversary of the sinking, photos were released showing possible human remains resting on the ocean floor. The photos, taken by Robert Ballard during an expedition led by NOAA in 2004, show a boot and a coat close to Titanic's stern which experts called compelling evidence that it is the spot where somebody came to rest, and that human remains could be buried in the sediment beneath them. The wreck of the Titanic falls under the scope of the 2001 UNESCO Convention on the Protection of the Underwater Cultural Heritage. This means that all states party to the convention will prohibit the pillaging, commercial exploitation, sale and dispersion of the wreck and its artifacts. Because of the location of the wreck in international waters and the lack of any exclusive jurisdiction over the wreckage area, the convention provides a state cooperation system by which states inform each other of any potential activity concerning ancient shipwreck sites, like the Titanic, and cooperate to prevent unscientific or unethical interventions. Submersible dives in 2019 have found further deterioration of the wreck, including loss of the captain's bathtub. Between July 29 and August 4, 2019, a two-person submersible vehicle that was conducting research and filming a documentary crashed into the wreck. EYOS Expeditions executed the dives. It reported that the strong currents pushed the submersible into the wreck, leaving a red rust stain on the submersible's side. The report did not mention if the Titanic sustained damage. In May 2023, Magellan Limited, a deep-water seabed mapping company, announced that they had created a digital twin of the Titanic, showing the wreckage in a level of detail that had never been captured before. The company created the model from some 715,000 3D images, captured over the course of a six-week expedition in the summer of 2022, using two submersibles, named Romeo and Juliet. They mapped every millimeter of the wreckage as well as the entire three nautical mile, 5.6 kilometers, debris field. Creating the model took about eight months. On June 18, 2023, the submersible Titan, operated by OceanGate Expeditions, went missing in the North Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Newfoundland. The submersible, designed to carry five people, was carrying an expedition of tourists to view the wreckage of the Titanic. On June 22, 2023, the operating company announced that they believe the Titan crew were lost at sea after a catastrophic implosion of the submersible, and, six days later, the U.S. Coast Guard announced its discovery of presumed human remains consistent with such an implosion found within recovered remnants of the Titan. Legacy, Safety, Main Article, Changes in Safety Practices After the Sinking of the Titanic, An Ice Patrol Aircraft Inspecting an Iceberg, After the Disaster, Recommendations were made by both the British and American boards of inquiry stating that ships should carry enough lifeboats for all aboard, mandated lifeboat drills would be implemented, lifeboat inspections would be conducted, etc. Many of these recommendations were incorporated into the International Convention for the Safety of Life at Sea passed in 1914. The convention has been updated by periodic amendments, with a completely new version adopted in 1974. Signatories to the convention followed up with national legislation to implement the new standards. For example, in Britain, new rules for life-saving appliances were passed by the Board of Trade on May 8, 1914 and then applied at a meeting of British steamship companies in Liverpool in June 1914. 
Further, the United States government passed the Radio Act of 1912. This act, along with the International Convention for the Safety of Life at Sea, stated that radio communications on passenger ships would be operated 24 hours a day, along with a secondary power supply, so as not to miss distress calls. Also, the Radio Act of 1912 required ships to maintain contact with vessels in their vicinity as well as coastal onshore radio stations. In addition, it was agreed in the International Convention for the Safety of Life at Sea that the firing of red rockets from a ship must be interpreted as a sign of need for help. Once the Radio Act of 1912 was passed, it was agreed that rockets at sea would be interpreted as distress signals only thus removing any possible misinterpretation from other ships. In the same year, the Board of Trade chartered the Bark Scotia to act as a weather ship in the Grand Banks of Newfoundland, keeping a lookout for icebergs. A Marconi wireless telegraph was installed to enable her to communicate with stations on the coast of Labrador and Newfoundland. Finally, the disaster led to the formation and international funding of the International Ice Patrol, an agency of the U.S. Coast Guard that to the present day monitors and reports on the location of North Atlantic Ocean icebergs that could pose a threat to transatlantic sea traffic. Coast Guard aircraft conduct the primary reconnaissance. In addition, information is collected from ships operating in or passing through the ice area. Except for the years of the two world wars, the International Ice Patrol has worked each season since 1913. During the period, there has not been a single reported loss of life or property due to collision with an iceberg in the patrol area. Cultural, main article, cultural legacy of Titanic. Titanic Belfast, photographed in November 2017, Titanic has gone down in history as the ship that was called unsinkable. For more than 100 years, she has been the inspiration of fiction and non-fiction. She is commemorated by monuments for the dead and by museums exhibiting artifacts from the wreck. Just after the sinking, memorial postcards sold in huge numbers together with memorabilia ranging from tin candy boxes to plates, whiskey jiggers, and even black morning teddy bears. The sinking inspired many ballads such as The Titanic. Several survivors wrote books about their experiences, but it was not until 1955 that the first historically accurate book, A Night to Remember, was published. The first film about the disaster, Saved from the Titanic, was released only 29 days after the ship sank and had an actual survivor as its star, the silent film actress Dorothy Gibson. This film is considered lost. The British film A Night to Remember, 1958, is still widely regarded as the most historically accurate movie portrayal of the sinking. The most financially successful by far has been James Cameron's Titanic, 1997, which became the highest-grossing film in history up to that time, as well as the winner of 11 Oscars at the 70th Academy Awards, including Best Picture and Best Director for Cameron. The Titanic disaster was commemorated through a variety of memorials and monuments to the victims, erected in several English-speaking countries and in particular in cities that had suffered notable losses. These included Southampton and Liverpool in England, New York and Washington, D.C. in the United States, and Belfast and Cove, formerly Queenstown, in Ireland. A number of museums around the world have displays on Titanic, the most prominent is in Belfast, the ship's birthplace, see below. RMS Titanic Incorporated, which is authorized to salvage the wreck site, has a permanent Titanic exhibition at the Luxor Las Vegas Hotel and Casino in Nevada which features a 22-ton slab of the ship's hull. It also runs an exhibition which travels around the world. In Nova Scotia, Halifax's Maritime Museum of the Atlantic displays items that were recovered from the sea a few days after the disaster. They include pieces of woodwork such as paneling from the ship's first-class lounge and an original deck chair, as well as objects removed from the victims. In 2012 the centenary was marked by plays, radio programs, parades, 
exhibitions and special trips to the site of the sinking together with commemorative stamps and coins. Royal Mail, whose mail was carried by RMS, Royal Mail Ship, Titanic, issued ten first-class UK postage stamps, each with the crown seal, to mark the centenary of the disaster. In a frequently commented on literary coincidence, Morgan Robertson authored a novel called Futility in 1898 about a fictional British passenger liner with the plot bearing a number of similarities to the Titanic disaster. In the novel, the ship is SS Titan, a four-stacked liner, the largest in the world and considered unsinkable, like the Titanic, she sinks in April after hitting an iceberg and does not have enough lifeboats. In Northern Ireland, it took many decades before the significance of Titanic was promoted in Northern Ireland, where it was built by Harland and Wolfe in Belfast. While the rest of the world embraced the glory and tragedy of Titanic, it remained a taboo subject throughout the 20th century in its birth city. The sinking brought tremendous grief and was a blow to Belfast's pride. Its shipyard was also a place many Catholics regarded as hostile. In the latter half of the century, during a 30-year sectarian conflict, Titanic was a reminder of the lack of civil rights that in part contributed towards the Troubles. While the fate of Titanic remained a well-known story within local households throughout the 20th century, commercial investment in projects recalling RMS Titanic's legacy was modest because of these issues. After the Troubles and Good Friday Agreement, the number of overseas tourists visiting Northern Ireland increased. It was subsequently identified in the Northern Ireland Tourism Board's Strategic Framework for Action 2004-2007 that the significance of an interest in Titanic globally, partly due to the 1997 film Titanic, was not being fully exploited as a tourist attraction. Thus, Titanic Belfast was spearheaded, along with some smaller projects, such as a Titanic memorial. In 2012 on the ship's centenary, the Titanic Belfast visitor attraction was opened on the site of the shipyard where Titanic was built. It was Northern Ireland's second most visited tourist attraction with almost 700,000 visitors in 2016. Despite over 1,600 ships being built by Harland and Wolfe in Belfast Harbour, Queen's Island became renamed after its most famous ship, Titanic Quarter in 1995. Once a sensitive story, Titanic is now considered one of Northern Ireland's most revered and uniting symbols. Failed verification. In late August 2018, several groups were vying for the right to purchase the 5,500 Titanic relics that were an asset of the bankrupt Premier Exhibitions. Eventually, Titanic Belfast, Titanic Foundation Limited and the National Museums Northern Ireland joined with the National Maritime Museum as a consortium that was raising money to purchase the 5,500 artifacts. The group intended to keep all of the items together as a single exhibit. Oceanographer Robert Ballard said he favored this bid since it would ensure that the memorabilia would be permanently displayed in Belfast, where Titanic was built, and in Greenwich. The museums were critical of the bid process set by the bankruptcy court in Jacksonville, Florida. The minimum bid for the October 11, 2018 auction was set at 21.5 million US dollars, 16.5 million pounds, and the consortium did not have enough funding to meet that amount. On October 17, 2018, the New York Times reported that a consortium of three hedge funds, Apollo Global Management, Alta Fundamental Advisors, and Packbridge Capital Partners had paid US$19.5 million US dollars for the collection. At the time of the purchase, the consortium agreed to continued oversight by the court concerning new exploration or salvage expedition must receive approval from NOAA and the court. Further, the purchase price gives Premier's unsecured creditors an 80% recovery. Replicas Main articles, Replica Titanic, Titanic II, and Romandizia Titanic. The first-class lounge of the Olympic, which was almost identical to that of the Titanic, seen today as a dining room in the White Swan Hotel, Alnwick. 
there have been several proposals and studies for a project to build a replica ship based on the Titanic. A project by South African businessman Sorel Gauss was abandoned in 2006, and a project by Australian businessman Clive Palmer was announced in 2012, known as the Titanic II. A Chinese shipbuilding company known as Wuchang Shipbuilding Industry Group Company, LTD commenced construction in November 2016 to build a replica ship of the Titanic for use in a resort. The vessel was to house many features of the original, such as a ballroom, dining hall, theater, first-class cabins, economy cabins, and swimming pool. Tourists were to be able to reside inside the Titanic during their time at the resort. It was to be permanently docked at the resort and feature an audio-visual simulation of the sinking, which has caused some criticism. As of 2022, however, it was reportedly only 25% complete, and its website and Twitter account are offline. RMS Olympic was the sister ship of the Titanic. The interior decoration of the dining salon and the grand staircase were in identical style and created by the same craftsman. Large parts of the interior of the Olympic were later sold and are now in the White Swan Hotel, Onwick, which gives an impression of how the interior of the Titanic looked. My name is Aria. Please like, share, subscribe and hit that notification bell so you can be the first to be notified whenever we post you won't regret it.